It's truly a true, true honor and privilege uh, to introduce our 2022 Sages Marx lecturer this morning, Dr. Kay Marie King. And I'll just give you a few words of introduction before we ask Dr. King to come up. Uh, Dr. King is Chief of Surgery at Albany Medical College Hospital and the Henry and Sally Schaefer Chair of Surgery at Albany Medical College. She became the first black female Chair of Surgery at an academic health sciences center in the United States when she was appointed six months ago. A fellowship trained paddlebiliary and pancreas surgeon, Dr. King previously was Professor of Surgery at Morehouse and Chief of Surgery and Medical Director for Surgical Quality at Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta including serving as an ISQIP sur surgeon champion. Dr. King completed her fellowship training at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where she also earned a master's degree in biomedical science. She completed residency training in general surgery and a research fel fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh after earning her medical degree at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. King also holds a Master of Business Management from Brandeis University. She, she, she is a United States Army veteran, having served in Operation Desert Storm. Dr. King has received numerous awards for, his research, for her research in the area of liver and pancreas cancer, and has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. Uh, in addition to serving as co-chair uh, of our program committee here at SAGES, she's program chair for the Society of Black Academic Surgeons, serge on the, serves on the board of trustees at the SSAT, and is an oral examiner for the American Board of Surgery. It is really a true pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. King as our Marx lecturer. Good morning. Thank you, President uh, Fellman and SAGE's leadership for selecting me as the Gerald Marx lecturer. Dr. Gerald Marx is the founder and president of SAGES. And the talk, this talk, is a lot about firsts. I'll recount stories of pioneers, much like Dr. Marx, who persisted because of, not in spite of, experiencing great adversity. When I look at the history of past Gerald Marx lecturers, I am in the company of past presidents and surgical leaders such as Dr. James Cameron, Andrew Warshaw, and ABS Director Joe Beiske. I'm truly honored and I'm grateful for recognizing in me something worthy enough to join the company of the surgeons on this illustrious list. Whenever I speak, my intention is to enrich the lives of the audience. I'm sorry, this is very emotional. Thank you. I was personally enriched in preparing this lecture, and I hope you can share in that experience. In 2021, I accepted the role of the Henry Sally Schaefer Chair of Surgery and Chief of Surgery at the Albany Medical Center in Albany, New York. It was a dream job that came true and came about from the recommendation of colleagues. Like most things in life, I had not anticipated this move at the moment, nor planned for it, but I was truly delighted of the opportunity to use all my skill sets and experience to lead a team I had come to admire. There was a three-month gap from when I signed the contract to when the announcement was made public, and that time was a highly reflective period. During it, I recalled quite vividly sitting in my residency interview at UPMC with then-chair Dr. Richard Simmons, and, and he asked, what do you want for your future? And I naively said, I want your job. <laughs> I want to be a chair of surgery. And over time, that vision grew more unachievable and at times unfathomable. And so the actuality of the reality gave me pause. When the announcement was made, I read the comments that I had broken through a glass ceiling. Breaking through glass ceilings is a powerful metaphor 
for the advancement of those who previously were not given those opportunities. But there is an understanding of what can happen, especially when women break through glass ceilings. I had broken through a glass ceiling to step onto a glass cliff. Michelle Ryan and Alex Hasman of the University of Exeter have coined the term glass cliff. It's the occurrence of how women achieve leadership roles and that it actually frequently occurs during crisis or periods of downturn when the risk of failure is highest. A research study in this phenomenon revealed that 63% of those surveyed think a woman should take over in a crisis, but women CEOs are 45% more likely to fail during those times or be fired, especially when men are the norm in leadership. I would take on my role during two of the most and biggest crises of our time. The COVID pandemic and the fallout of the George Floyd death that we so public, publicly experienced was permanently ingrained in our collective mindset. The world was responding with change after witnessing how George Floyd died. There began a movement by many industries to reverse infrastructure barriers that led to inequities. The House of Surgery was no different. My state of mind was influenced by this cultural context. To be successful, it's very important not only to understand history, but to openly discuss the impacts of history on what we see in our present and how we can impact our future. There are those who may still believe that women should not be surgeon, surgeons in spite of data highlighting otherwise, just as there are th those who believe that people of color cannot be great leaders. It's not really those individuals that I seek to reach today, but the ones who are looking to us to guide them into a new reality. It is important for us to have reflections of ourselves on stages like sages, in the C-suite, in front of the podium of a large comp comp campus, or leading a lab of researchers because we cannot afford not to do it. We cannot afford to have the next Einstein or Gandhi or Picasso not exist because they were deemed unworthy. I was delighted because the job opportunity I mentioned was a dream. I must admit I was part happy and in part angry. I was angry that I was the first. I was angry that there were notable black females before me who were not afforded this opportunity. I was angry that I understood that women were usually given roles during challenges, times that put them at failure. And I was angry because I knew there would be murmurings of why her, not knowing all the work I'd put in to be who I am today. I really wanted to distill where the anger came from and so that I could move past it. And that led me to think about the world around me. And it was during this period of reflection that I came about seeing this book called Cast. In one book, the author summarizes, she's an anthropologist, the history of America and its history and relationship to slavery. This is not something we speak of publicly or openly, but given the death of George Floyd, Americans, much like myself, have really tried to seek an understanding of the world and how we got there. The book outlines the repercussions of slavery and its impact to modern times, and how we interact and relate to each other. The book theorizes that we in America live in a caste system. The concept was quite shocking, yet intriguing, because it allowed me to see my reality with a new lens. The book details that our policies and our laws uphold that caste system, and our profession is not exempt. The mechanisms used to codify laws and therefore behaviors must be scrutinized intensely to see how we can evolve from such a place where some are excluded to not having our most brilliant minds together at the table solving our collective concerns. The book defines caste as in hierarchy where there is withholding of respect, status, honor, attention, privileges, resources, benefit of the doubt, and human kindness to someone on the basis of their perceived rank in the hierarchy. 
Ms. Wilkinson suggests that racism is merely one manifestation to the, to the degree in which we have internalized the larger American caste system. The concept is quite shocking. But I stand before you now as the first African-American woman to lead a department of surgery because collectively we have experienced a shift, a shift where that reality can exist. The black women before me were not granted that respect, status, attention, privilege, resources, or benefit of the doubt, and human kindness to be at the top of the hierarchy. The first really is never the first. We stand on the shoulders of others who've come before us. And this slide is an image from the poster of Hidden Figures, the um, story that was recounted of NASA scientists and mathematicians who helped the launch of the first uh, space race and allowed us to win the space race. These women were critical to, and contributed greatly to the, the success of that story, yet they're not written in history. Much like that movie, surgery has its hidden figures, where in spite of intense adversity, these women have contributed greatly to the advancements of medicine. I want to dedicate some of my time Thank you. I want to dedicate some of my time at this podium to honor these women, many whose name you've never heard, who have risen through barriers to contribute to our beloved profession in meaningful ways. <laughs> this is our story. I want to start with Dr. Rebecca Crumpler. She grew up with an aunt who cared for the sick and was considered a local doctor. She trained as a nurse and helped to care for women and children in the middle of the Civil War. Crumpler worked for the Freedmen's Bureau to provide medical care for freed slaves who were refused care by white physicians. The needs of the Civil War offered opportunities and she was sponsored to attend medical school by the doctor she worked with. They regarded her with great respect. It was at a time, though, when men thought the brain of women were only 10% that of men, and she suffered intense racism and sexism. She completed medical school before the Civil War end, and her medical colleagues would not fill her prescriptions or listen to her medical op opinions, but she persevered. After the Civil War, she moved to Richmond, Virginia, believing that treatment of women and children was ide the ideal way to perform her missionary work. At a time in history when African Americans were prohibited from learning and reading how to write, learning how to read and write, Dr. Crumpler published a book of medical discourses, one of the very first medical publications by an African American. She had the audacity to go to medical school during the Civil War. Dr. Helen Octavia Dickens was the first African-American certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 1948. She later served as the director of the Mercy Douglas Hospital, Department of Surgery, I'm sorry, Department of OBGYN in Philadelphia, treating the underserved. In 1950, she became the first woman to be inducted into the American College of Surgery, black woman, as a fellow. And in 1951, she became the chief of OBGYN. She rolled out a major project in Philadelphia that was funded by the NIH to encourage doctors to perform pap smears for cervical cancer in women. Dr. Jane Cook, known as the godmother of chemotherapy, her father was the, one of the first African-American graduates of a Harvard Medical School, and he set a high standard for his daughters. Dr. Lewis Wright was the first African-American doctor to be a staff member at a municipal hospital in New York City, and in 1929 became the city's first African-American surgeon. He established the Cancer Research Center at Harlem Hospital 
and he encouraged Jane Wright to consider, rather than doing art, to do medicine. And she graduated with honors from the New York Medical College in 1949. Working with her father, they established the research on cancer that would change cancer research. They would successfully perform tissue culture research rather than in mice in, 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 the, in the lab and later established the role of methotrexate in the treatment of breast cancer. In addition, she's credited with establishing precision medicine through her work in developing a non-surgical procedure to, develop, to deliver chemotherapy to targeted tumors such, in, such as those in the kidney and spleen, which were previously non-accessible. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson appointed Dr. Wright to the President's Commission of Heart Disease, Cancer, and Stroke and the National Cancer Advisory Board. She was the only female co-founder of ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Dr. Lavinia Brown is the first African-American woman surgeon in the South. In 1944, she was, ex she was afforded that opportunity and in 1955 was the first African-American female general surgeon to become a fellow of the ACS. She survived great hardship. At five years old, her mother had surrendered her to the Troy Orphan Asylum, an orphanage in Troy, New York, and she stayed there until the age of 12. But she was inspired to do surgery as a career after she received a tonsillectomy and she wanted to make African Americans proud. From 1957 to 1983, Dr. Brown served as the Chief of Surgery at Nashville Riverside Hospital and later was a member of the Tennessee House of Representatives so that she could advocate on behalf of women and children. Dr. Patricia Bath, she's the first African American ophthalmology residency graduate in 1976, because of the disparities she observed, she co-founded the American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness, and in 1983, became the first graduate and went on to be the leader at UCLA Drew uh, program, residency program. She developed and patented the Laser Faker Probe, a device that revolutionized cataract surgery, the probe would use laser to break up cataracts and aspirate the cataracts after that procedure. She's also credited for creating the field of community ophthalmology to lead efforts at, public, at educating the public on disease prevention, and she served as, again, the residency program at Drew UCLA. Dr. Rosalind Scott is the first black female thoracic surgeon. She was the first Mary A. Farley Fellow at the famed Texas Heart Institute. She developed the first regional simulation center for the VA and is a founding member of SBAS and the first African American admitted to the Society of University Surgeons. Dr. Alexa Kennedy, she's the first female, black female neurosurgeon who interned at Yale and completed her residency at the University of Minnesota. She faced extreme prejudice in school, and in one instance, a family member who was training in psychology tested her for her intelligence, and she scored very highly. Her family was surprised because her performance in school was average. They later discovered that her teacher had been switching her test scores with a white student to cover up her intelligence. Dr. Kennedy went on to specialize in pediatric neurosurgery, and she is the inventor of a program, programmable anti-siphon shunt to treat hydrocephaly, which is still used today. Dr. Kennedy worked at the Children's Hospital, Hospital and led as Chief of Surgery, Neurosurgery from 1987 to 2001. In modern times, you may know some of these faces. Dr. Velma Scandalberry is the first African-American transplant surgeon and I met her during my interview with Dr. Simmons. He called her down to, to meet me that day, and she would mentor me throughout my years as a trainee. Dr. Deborah Ford is the first colorectal surgeon graduating from the University of Texas in Houston in 1991, 
She is now a distinguished ACS Master Educator and Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Howard University School of Medicine. Dr. Andrea Hayes is the first black female pediatric surgeon in North America. You may have heard her speak. She, has, she recounts trying three times to get into pediatric surgeon, surgery in America until she decided and an opportunity was afforded her in Canada. So she became the first African American to be trained in North America. Without her tenacity, she would not hold that distinction. This journey, this January, she started her role as chair of surgery at Howard University. Dr. Ayla Stanford, who trained with me at University of Pittsburgh, is the first black pediatric surgeon to complete her training in the US. She has recently received great accolades for her work, not only in academic surgery. Dr. Stanford has, if you haven't heard, she is now listed as a CNN hero and just received the Philadelphia Award for her work done during COVID. She realized the disparities that existed in the vaccination of black Philadelphians, and she and, she and a crew of five, 200 volunteers vaccinated over 50,000 people of Philadelphia. She has now launched her Center for Health and Equity. Dr. Gibb is an MIS surgeon and is now the chair of surgery at Yale's Bridgeport Hospital starting in September, much like myself. And Dr. Patricia Turner, who many of you know and respect greatly, has just taken the helm as the executive director for the ACS. These are just a few of the stories of black women, all of whom could have held this distinction, and many of whom have contributed greatly to the field of surgery. It gives me great pleasure to highlight their stories today because their stories are all our stories. Disparities are real and entrenched. It took 66 years from the first fellow black female surgeon admitted to the ACS to the first black female chair of surgery. My hope is that it will not take so long to get more leaders to be recognized. Recently, the History of Medicine, Institute of History of Medicine at Johns Hopkins had a call for papers for a conference that will focus on racism in academic medicine. This reckoning is an important step forward. And as I mentioned be before, it's really important to understand the past because it helps us not to repeat what was done in the past. And during my time in reflection, I wanted to further understand the role of the history of medicine with regards to race. As a medical student, I had taken a history and medicine course as an elective, but some of this information I knew, in, I learned now in preparation for this lecture, and I'd like to share some of that with you. American medicine has followed the social experience, and medicine has not been immune to the impact of slavery in America. There's a big push for reconciliation, and the largest organization of medical professionals, the AMA, recently released a statement of apology to the black organization similarly missioned the National Medical Association, which was founded based on a need as they were undesired and actively excluded in the AMA. In fact, the exclusion of blacks from local and national organizations led to the creation of many black medical societies and medical schools. This is a photo of the inaugural class of the Leonard Medical School in North Carolina in 1866 and its faculty. The school was sponsored by missionaries who believed that African Americans should have access to a medical school education. And by 1882, there were four medical schools dedicated and committed to the education of black um, physicians. Only two of those sc schools remain today, Howard University and Meharry. This historical timeline 
from 1864, when the first black female was graduated, graduated medical school, to 1968, when Howard University opens its, opened its door, to the end of the Civil War, we see a rapid rise in the number of medical schools in the nation. There were varying standards, and the Council of Medical Education was formed to change that. They started tracking state licensors and offered medical schools the ability to obtain certification, which required a lot of finances, finances that the black medical schools did not meet. The schools, therefore, were ranked consistently in the bottom 20% of all schools. To address the overall desperate educational process among medical schools, the Carnegie, Me Mental, uh, the Carnegie Foundation called on Abram Flexner, an educator, to evaluate all medical schools, which he did with rigor. After his survey he, in 1920, he published the famed Flexner Report, and the recommendation from the Flexner Report was to close 40% of all of the white schools and 71% of the black medical schools. There were at the time schools who specifically trained women to become doctors. It was recommended that all of those schools be closed. The rationale was that integration of women into the mainstream medical schools would not require additional schools to do so, and that white doctors would care for black patients, and so black medical schools were not needed. By 1923, only two black medical schools were left, and they struggled financially to remain solvent. Howard and Meharry School of Medicine would continue to train 75% of all black physicians in the United States well into the 1980s. If we fast forward to contemporary times, not much has really changed. Blacks make up 4% of all surgery and a similar percentage of all trainees. Yet the data released by the AAMC shows that once accepted in training, over 25% in green at the bottom of all residents dismissed are African American. With regards to women, the story of leadership opportunities still is a challenge. Women now still face a lot of resistance in medicine, and yet they comprise 51% of medical student medical students, but only 18% of chairs and deans are women, and a single digit for black women. We need to dismantle racism in American medicine, because the very profession can be weaponized and used against people of color. If you are non-conforming to the white male normative, you can be penalized in ways that lead you not to advance in medical school or not get the honor of the AOA. The experience of the people of color can be isolating. You can feel unwelcomed and undesired. Now it's time to really cry. These are the words from a talented black medical student that I mentored from his first year of medical school. He was now in his third year, and he was very much interested in pursuing a path in surgery. He was on a rotation with me when I scheduled a meeting to talk to him about staying at our institution. As we had our conversation, he leaned in the chair towards me and said to me, why would you want to recruit me here when they treat you so poorly? There are defining moments in life after which you'll never be the same, and this day was one of them. It was like Morpheus made me choose between the green and red pill. In that moment, my reality changed because I realized I was moving through life with rose-colored glasses in a way that protected me from the real experiences of avert and microaggressions. I had created a narrative that I, I was somehow protected by my pedigree, my contributions, my hard work. And in that moment, I realized that I had, I had adopted to and internalized my experiences as if they were okay. 
This experience led me to re-examine my life, and I concluded that I lost sight of who I was and what was important to me. I was living a lie, and I had to find a way to truth. That way to truth required internal and intentional personal accountability. The student went on to tell me how I was being openly undermined, and I realized I had some big choices to make. It took time, worsening scenarios, and lots of conversations, but I finally made the decision to jump and do so without a parachute, instead building a bridge as I went. This experience highlighted how hard it is to swim against the current and how important it is for advocates to help you persist through difficulty. Once I made the decision, other areas needing my attention was exposed, and I systematically had to focus on my physical health, my marriage, and other important domains in my life. I sank into a dark space, a space I didn't recognize. I felt isolated, targeted, and undesired. But my personal board of directors, my family, and many of you in the room would not allow me to stay there. I was reminded of who I was. They promised me a vision of success and they were daily, daily in support of me as I rebuilt. I determined I needed a sabbatical, a concept not promoted in our field. I had to work on, on myself, and I wanted to ensure that history was not repeated. That required me to absorb what I had been through and forgive myself as I felt that I had betrayed myself. I had worked hard to restore my physical health and creating new dreams, and I read furiously. One of the books that helped me to reset and realign my mindset was the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. I learned to move from a fixed to a growth mindset. A mindset, a fixed mindset believes that your basic qualities, such as your talents and, and, and intelligence, are innate. A growth mindset understands that qualities are developed with practice and effort. And working through my pain, I determined that I would adopt new processes that guided my choices and behavior. I wanted to learn compassion and to live with intention. As I closed the door of this part of my life, another one opened. I quote Marion Williamson in the Book of Miracles, Often the moment of surrender is not when life is over, but when it begins. I had completed a leadership course from the ACS in partnership with Brandeis University. And after completing that course, I received a call from the course director asking me to be a part of the inaugural MBA class. I told him no, I was in the midst of a crisis. He persisted and explained that he thought I would add value to the class, and I said no. Then he had the dean call, and they shared that they thought my participation would help in the success of the class. And the scholarship that they offered helped tip me over to say yes. It was one of the biggest and best decisions of my life. For a year and a half, I would be surrounded by 33 extraordinary healthcare leaders, some of you in the room, Dr. Talamini's one, who saw the best of me and helped me heal with their openness and compassion. Concurrently, I was afforded the work to work in rural areas in America and learned lessons in healthcare that I otherwise would not have learned. Those lessons and understanding of rural and community hospitals are now helping me today as I help my organization move towards an integrated health system. I realigned my vision and what was important to me and wanted an experience where I could care for the underserved, and I was granted that with employment at Morehouse and Grady. They offered me that opportunity. The gift I received was to be fully seen, and I was offered, and I offered to them a new and more authentic me. I worked with amazing faculty and trainees, and in this environment, 
I flourished and came into my own as a leader. While at Grady, this book helped me to continue my personal growth. The book is a guide on how to reconcile your past and your future by focusing on rebuilding broken bridges. The book helped me determine definitively what type of leader I wanted to be. The breadth of my experiences, the highs and the lows, afforded me a broad and emotional lens, and I knew I wanted to lead with compassion. Compassionate leaders seek influence, not authority. They do not demand. They encourage. They lead with hope. They guide, acknowledge, and support team members to combine their efforts, skills, talents, insights, passion, and enthusiasm, and commitment to work together for the greater good. The women highlighted here exemplify this leadership style that I highlight today, and their painful experiences allowed for them to appreciate the importance of compassion, and they will go on to build hospitals, nonprofits, and change the lives of many because of this compassion. You heard me recount some of the fits and the starts to move to an inclusive healthcare system. Can I call on all of you to partner to sustain this change? I can personally recommend a model to use moving forward where the centrally located focus of compassion helps guide your leadership. Compassion alone is not enough. As an HBR recent article showed, you need wisdom, and wisdom comes from experience. Flanking compassion is creating the space of belonging, intentional mentorship, sponsorship, and unconditional support. And I will highlight the beautiful ways in which the House of Surgery has done that for me. Belonging. After I went to my residency interview, Melina Kidby called me. She was a second year, and she said, we loved you. We want you to work with us and be a part of our team. And when I went to Mayo in my fellowship, Mike Saar said, you're a black woman. I know here is important. Let me introduce you to other black women. <laughs> As I won my SSAT research award, Dr. Traverso pulled me in and un under his wings and made me a part of his research database project of which I would publish. And when I went to Jeff Matthews and said, I'd like to help with diversity and inclusion in the SSAT, he made me chair of the task force. And these people during the darkest time, when I felt like I couldn't see tomorrow, they wrote me letters of recommendations, encouraged me. LD Britt called me every day to make sure I was okay. And the person who told me to jump, <laughs> couldn't believe he told me that, Ed Barksdale would be there in support of me. And as I transitioned in my role as chair, my first chair of surgery, Dr. Claude Deschamps, he sent me a care package with all the lessons he had learned as being chair. And these are my peer mentors, many of whom you know. Carla Pugh told me, hold on, you cannot leave academic medicine when I said I wanted to leave. Patrick Thomas, he met me during the residency interviews and he said, I know you're gonna be a chair of surgery one day. He would tell me that every single time he spoke to me. But all of these people on this slide, when I learned from them, I grew from them, and they have been some of my best friends through the years. <laughs> Sponsorship is so important. It's hard to get through those doors, and many of the people here helped me walk through doors. I'm a part of Sages because Dan Jones called me after working with me in the SSAT and said, Sages could benefit from you. I want you to be a part of it, and that's why I'm here today. The CMO of Grady, 
Jansen, he called me his MVP. When I left, they called weekly asking when I would come back. And Jennifer Seng called me to say that I should interview for the chair of surgery at Albany. And my new, my new boss, Vince Verdal, in the bottom right, when I interviewed with him, I said, are you ready to have a black woman chair surgery? He stood up and said, why wouldn't I be? I said, well, people may try to work around me and come to you. He said, then they can leave. And I said, I knew I could work, work with him. But these folks were there for me through, through it all. And so as we move, I'd like us to reflect on how we could move forward to help other trailblazers and trailblaze a path to inclusion, abandoning the caste system that rigidly holds onto all our hearts and mind. It will take intentional and very personal work, a self-assessment that is honest, raw, and that drives change on both a very personal and collective level. Take into consideration the history I've recounted. I want for all of you to pick one of these words on the screen. Close your eyes, and I'm gonna set a timer for 15 minutes. I want you to recall a moment when someone made you feel like you belonged where you felt compassion, where you felt that you were sponsored or mentored. Really hold on to that image. Now open your eyes. I want you to share that moment that you felt within you with someone who looks different than you, who may not think like you, who may not speak like you, and afford them the same opportunity you had. Thank you very much. Some people here today. I'd like to thank Dr. King. I think thank you is a little too uh, too too weak for uh, the gift uh, uh, Dr. King has shared with us, which is the gift of her authentic courage to uh, share her story and her insights into her and our lineage. Uh, and I think there's no one in this room that wasn't inspired by her words and uh, to, make a, to continue to make a difference. And I think we all leave here a little different than we came in. So uh, I'd like to just offer uh, just a small you know, little memento and uh, to thank her for, uh, for, for uh, speaking with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.